This is the More to the Story podcast with Dr. Andy Miller. We hope you guys enjoyed today's conversation. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the More to the Story podcast. I'm Andy Miller, and I'm coming to you from Wesley Biblical Seminary, where I serve as the academic dean and professor of theology here. And we would love for you to think about coming to Wesley Biblical Seminary, where we are developing trusted leaders for faithful churches. And that means not just people who are training for full-time ministry, but if you are involved, like in maybe teaching a Sunday school class or just actively involved in your church, it's likely we have something for you. So you could check us out at wbs.edu. Of course, we're also doing the traditional paths of training pastors. We we love the fact that we get to train people in the classical consensual tradition of the church. That is what what is kind of like goes right along with this podcast, where we are producing regular content from an Orthodox Wesleyan perspective. Perspective. That means we value the authority of Scripture. At the same time, we uh, we really think about the reality and promise of the holy life, to experience God's perfect love in our life by the power of the Holy Spirit, to be able to be sanctified through and through is a key theme of Wesley Biblical Seminary and something that we emphasize regularly on this podcast. If you don't know about this podcast, this is your first time checking it out, you can go back and find a backlog of a variety of podcasts we've done. Sometimes that's teaching from me. Generally, this fir- these first couple of months, we've done interviews with leaders like Caleb Loudon, who you'll hear from right here. I'm excited because Caleb is doing something and I, I hesitate to say Caleb's doing that. He's a part of a team, and I just interviewed Caleb, um, who is doing something creative within my denomination. I serve, I've serve. i served in the Salvation Army my whole life. Uh, I served as a Salvation Army officer for about 15 years. But one of the things that Caleb was able to do in this kind of large, kind of top-down, administrated organization in church denomination, he has developed a way to find kind of a micro community within the life of his Salvation Army Church. And I was just excited to get, you know ask him some questions about that. Some of those are penetrating questions, and he and I kind of disagree a little bit here and there, but I love what he's doing, and I hope it's something that you'll consider doing too. I think that this is a really a way forward for us to experience what God has for us. And that might express itself in your denomination in a different way, but I think Caleb and his team at his church are on to something really special. So you can find out more about that and I'll share some links here in the show notes. I'm thankful too to have uh, sponsors like Bill Roberts. Uh, Bill is a financial planner who comes alongside of people to help them to achieve their financial goals. He's particularly gifted with helping people who are ministry leaders and, you know, like particularly the challenges like we think of, like if you live in a house that's owned by your church or your denomination, like how, how do you think about thinking about planning financially for the future in those type of situations? He does a great job with that. And it's not just for that. I know he has many other clients, but we emphasize that on this podcast. Bill is somebody who comes at financial planning from a perspective of the kingdom. And I think you'll find that he's somebody you can trust. So you can find him at williamhroberts.com. So now I'm excited to share this podcast with you with Caleb Loudon. I know you'll be blessed by it as I was. And it goes on for a while, but it's something I think that leads us to a place of thinking about how the church can be the church in our time. God bless you. Welcome to the More to the Story podcast. I'm glad you've come along. And today I have my friend Caleb Loudon. Caleb, it's so good to see you and hear you. It's good to be here. And I've uh, been a long time listener of this podcast and... Super excited to now uh, be a part of that. I feel like when people used to call on the radio shows, they'd say something like, long time listener, first time caller. And that's <laughs> sort of where I For, Well, what an I honor. It so, shows there yeah. are listeners in the world, truly our listeners. So what a blessing. <laughs> it, and Caleb Absolutely. and I, it, like... We, we just got started to get going just before this because uh, it's easy just to get talking. And, and one of the people I enjoy talking to the most because we have similar histories. Caleb's significantly younger than me, but uh, in a good way. I'm trying to compliment you. Um, it, anyhow, it's we but we get along. We, we kind of speak a similar theological language, had some similar background. And I just enjoy plotting for the future with him. And he's doing something really unique as part of the leadership team of the Creekside Church. And we're going to hear about that. But, Cale, before we get too far, just give folks a little sense of who you are and where you've been uh, and b- before you got to this place where you're serving with you and your wife and friends at, at Creekside. Thank you. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, so I uh, am a lifelong salvationist, one who... Um, is the son of officers and um, my mom's side there's several generations of salvationism on that side of the family 
Um, and uh, so the Salvation Army has been a very familiar part of my life for a, a long time. And so growing up, I moved around quite a bit. I think I lived in 13 different houses before I graduated high school. Wow. Uh, I don't know if that, I think that's the right number. Wow. Lost count. Um, and so there's a lot of transition that took me to all sorts of places like Oklahoma and North Carolina and Atlanta and Florida and just all over the Southeast. And I love my upbringing. I really enjoyed uh, the experiences that I had as being an officer's kid and um, had a great home life and great parents. And then when I uh, graduated high school, I went to the University of South Florida. I was a part of the uh, college house program there in Tampa. And um, at the tail end of that, that time there at USF, I was um, going to be a part of the Salvation Service Corps that summer, okay. uh, the summer after I graduated. And during our leaders orientation there, I uh, was invited to go on a prayer walk that was guided by this little uh, primer that we were given. And I, I didn't really take the opportunity all that seriously at first, but as I continued to read through it, I started to experience the Holy Spirit ministering to me in some profound ways. And through the course of that walk, uh, I ended up being called into ministry. I um, had had a long time interest in politics. I've been a bit of a politico since I was about 12 years old and just followed the, yeah, followed the news avidly just and still uh, probably consume more news than I should to this day. Um, but uh, God just really put me on a very different trajectory through the course of that prayer walk. Okay. And um, lined up some of the most significant parts of my life, like my call to ministry, also uh, my co-leader for that summer. as uh, a young woman named Kendall Eigelhart at the time, who right. is now Kendall Loudon, my wife. <laughs> And in, and in the course of the prayer walk, there were just things I was receiving about even that p aspect of my life. And Wow. Um, it's not one, so it, one night, one prayer walk itself? It was just one prayer walk in the afternoon, and uh, the Lord um, spoke directly a passage for me to look up from Hebrews, Hebrews 5, 6. And it's a reference to uh, Jesus's um, status as our high priest yeah. and it, it's the whole the whole verse is you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek right and I up until that point I've been praying you know as a college graduate like what what's the next step Lord and, and struggling with calling but I began to realize and looking back on my life how God had been shaping me all my life for full-time vocational ministry and then reading that passage and getting that sense of this being of me participating in Christ's uh, role in that way and that kind of ministry and it being something that is forever irrevocable. Yeah. Uh, I felt God was asking me to surrender that aspect of my life. And I did. And it was amazing how God opened up so many doors thereafter. I mean, I, uh, I'd always admired or admired for quite some time, uh, graduates of Asbury Theological Seminary, yeah. particularly, uh, Dennis Kinlaw, who I know is a yeah. hero of yours as well. Yeah. And my dad had turned me on to his preaching. And so I would, I, I remember at the Tampa Court, I found the library cassette tapes of his from uh, officers' councils he did for the Florida wow. officers back in, I don't know, 91 or 92. And I just so happened to have a car with a cassette tape player. And that was the only cassette tape player I had. So I'd drive around just to listen to his preaching. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I always admired folks who were attached to Asbury Seminary in some way. And so I felt led to that for that to be my next step in this calling yeah. experience. And so I applied about midway through the summer, didn't what wasn't accepted until the Friday before classes started. Wow. And then my parents and I hurried up to Wilmore from Fort Myers, Florida, and got me settled. I began classes uh, I think two days late there. And then about two weeks later, I was fortunate enough to get a scholarship that covered 80 percent of my tuition Wow! Uh, because someone just out of the blue dropped out of that program and that opened up for me and then two years later same thing happened with another scholarship that then gave me a full ride scholarship and wow. along with some other so i just say all to say uh that i love to testify to what god did for me in that moment and to his faithfulness yeah uh, that when the lord calls you and you answer he is faithful yeah. and 
um, just so grateful for uh, that those precious moments in uh, the woods there in North Georgia, Camp Grandview. So yeah, yeah. You no, know, that's where that happened. Interest now, uh, yeah. you don't. You, some people might hear what you're saying. They might just assume that you're a Salvation Army officer or a clergy sure. in the Salvation Army. So you went to Asbury Seminary, but you don't serve as an officer. Tell us. So what is it you've been doing since you graduated from Asbury Seminary? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I, while called to ministry, uh, to full-time vocational ministry, um, I ha haven't still felt a call to Salvation Army officership. Always been open to that call. Right. Um, and you have to uh, learn how to express these things very clearly. And, <laughs> and you're threading the needle well. <laughs> Thread the needle. I mean, uh, the, the. You have um, to add the point. I'm open, and of course, I'm open too. Even though I've uh, left Salvation Army <laughs> officership, I'm open to being called yeah. back in. Just as he called exactly. me out, he called me back in. So I, I, I'm threading the needle with you. Yeah, the road to the training school is paved with folks who uh, had said no at one point or another, and then uh, you know the Lord did something different. Um, so, but no, really, I, I've been open to that. But there are um, two aspects just of my particular journey that um, I look to that seemed to be calling me in a different direction. One was, um, as I was growing up and, you know, having friends who we would meet for divisional events, be a part of divisional groups together and whatnot, I watched as they got older and then became less and less attached to their core. Yeah. And um, through that experience, one of the things I, I observed that I think is, uh, there's some truth to is that the Salvation Army as a um, our kind of polity, our mode for mission is heavily reliant on local officers Yeah, because we have an itinerant system where the officers in the Salvation Army are often called to take a new appointment. And when that happens, um, that transition can open up all kinds of new wonderful opportunities for a core, uh, but it can also um, provide the opportunity for some things to be dropped or to be lost or yeah. for relationships to, um, for sure. you know, to, to suffer for what one reason or another. So all to say, I recognize through that the need for really good, committed, long-term local officers, local leaders yeah. Uh, yeah. to partner with our commissioned officers in ministry uh, and to um, be a part of um, you know, to, to see themselves as uh, aids to them when there is that transition. Yeah. And, uh, and so that, that, was, that was part of it. And also just wanting to, um, you know, help to foster that kind of long-term community too that comes from that yeah. um, and to um, see a renewal in that. I think that's something that the whole church struggles with at yeah. one level or another is that the church could really be that, uh, church that we find there in the second chapter of Acts, you know, this, this church that's characterized by koinonia, by this mm -hmm. deep fellowship united mm -hmm. in the common cause and uh, in the, and being devoted to the apostles teaching and prayer and the breaking of bread, like just that sense of intimacy and community given so many social factors, that's a much more difficult thing to realize, I yeah. think. Yeah. And it requires folks who are going to be there for a while to, to help uh, accomplish. Yeah. So you and did the, that. The second, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Keep going. So you did that in Watch the context it. of serving in, in part as a as a paid position at a uh, for a Salvation Army, a large Salvation Army church or a large Salvation Army corps. But maybe you're yes. going to say something else. Uh, just that, that another part of it too was just my wife's calling. Right. Um, she, Kendall is um, very clearly called to be a therapist. She's a mental health Right. counselor. Um, her background is in marriage and family therapy. She's a licensed counselor. And um, I just think she's the best therapist I've ever met, you know, and uh, and I, I, I just know that God uses her in so many powerful ways through that vocation. So that's been another aspect. Of right. It, and those who don't know, where you, uh, some of this language, those of you who aren't connected to the Salvation Army, in the Salvation Army, at least in the United States and most places in the world, uh, husband and wife, have to serve together, which is a beautiful thing. And and Caleb Absolutely. and I both experienced that through our parents and and me when Abby and I served together for close to fifteen years. Like we understood the richness of that, and like many people would be jealous 
of that opportunity. But that, nevertheless, it comes to a place where like um, both people have to sense a calling to that. And so not only did you not f- feel that direction, but it certainly yeah. isn't the case for your wife. If she, uh, they might be a way for her to serve in some counseling role, but probably yeah. not to really function as a career as a family therapist is probably not going to happen. There might be ways to use that as an officer, but it's probably not going to be fulfilled. Yeah, I think you said that so well. It is such a beautiful, rich part of our tradition, and I've seen the incredible um, benefit of that in in the lives of the officers that I really admire. Yeah. Um, uh, but just we we had. Uh, two different callings, and, yeah. and that's you know, where, what we pursued. So. Abby and I are working through that a little bit now ourselves. I won't, I won't make you the therapist for me at the moment, but uh, <laughs> uh, it's like just us getting through. Like I've had Abby at my side for f- 14, 15 years, um, sure. and she's made me so much better in my work. And but at the same time, too, there's some good that comes in distinguishing things. Like we we would have trouble saying like where work would end, where work for the core would end and where our family mm-hmm. life would start. Like it was so mixed up. So there's, mm-hmm. but I, I'll say like sitting in my office right now, I do miss her. I do miss having her mm-hmm. around. Well, like we're, we're figuring that out, but it's also clear that God's called her to take an active role in our home and in homeschooling our kids. And mm-hmm. um, we're still sharing in, in a fair amount, but it, it is distinct. So like, I appreciate you saying, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I am interested yeah. in like the transition that you made. Then, so you feel a call of vocational ministry and you go to mm-hmm. seminary and you get married and your your wife's not going to be a Salvation Army officer. You don't feel called to be a Salvation Army officer. So how did that find, so how did you mix all these things, marry all these things um, in Atlanta? Yeah. Well, I was highly interested uh, because of Asbury in core planting or yeah. planting. Um, we also have a, another level of uh, community called mission stations. Um, yeah. So I was very interested in planting of some kind. And Asbury has this great church planting initiative that was launched around the time I was at Asbury. Yeah. Uh, in seminary. So um, I reached out to the program secretary at the time um, Colonel Needham and uh, he and Colonel Marty uh, were very kind enough to go out to lunch with Kendall and I and to just hear about our callings and um, just were so wonderful in receiving us in that way. And, uh, you know, they're very enthusiastic about what we were feeling uh, led to pursue. And so he connected me to um, the area commander here in Atlanta. We we're looking at Atlanta because Kendall had an opportunity to work uh, in Atlanta and um, it was a wonderful opportunity. And so, and I, I Atlanta is a place that I had lived for six years uh, growing up and actually as a member of the Atlanta Temple Corps. And so it, in many ways, Atlanta has been home for both of us. Yeah, sure. Uh, um, so uh, we, Um, Landed on Atlanta, and I was connected to Major Hawks, who was also very wonderful and open to uh, what God was doing and and what we were pursuing. And then he uh, thought it would be helpful to connect me to Captain um, Ken Argot, Captains Ken and Amy Argot at the Atlanta Temple Corps. And um, I just can't say enough good things about them. The Argots, I love them so much, and uh, they were very enthusiastic and welcoming. And uh, you know, were, they were not looking to hire anyone for um, what was interesting me before I approached them. Right. And they were able to um, catch the vision right away and to um, start to retool their ministry team. And I came on board and. Um, uh, was given the responsibility of ministering to our young adults, and uh, and then over the years accumulated a couple other things, as is uh, often the case in the Salvation <laughs> Army. <laughs> uh, ringing these type of things, probably I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, ministry to our uh, to those experiencing homelessness in our community yeah, yeah. sometimes a con, and um, and uh, community outreach as well. Just going to chamber of commerce meetings and all that fun stuff um, and and some community development. But my principal thing was our ministry for young adults. And um, 
yeah, that, that's that's really why I saw as my primary vocation there. And somehow this is connected to church planning, or you say core planning, church planning, Salvation Army unit of operations. Yeah. Core. So somehow that gets mingled in here. Um, along the way, as you're serving the young adults, it moves to become what is now identified as Creekside. And this is incredibly fascinating to me, like how this was connected. And, and those who are in my audience, um, some of you who are Salvationists outside of Southern Territory, I'm going to, like, Atlanta Temple is like the, and I mean this in because there's a lot of good things about it, like what I'm going to say, but it's like a shrine almost to Salvationism in the territory. And, and I would imagine other denominations have that, like wherever the denominational headquarters is, like, there's probably a church in that city that just represents a lot of the history. Um, leaders have come through there. And, and this is a, a building that is large for, I mean, far outside. I mean, uh, much far larger than any other Salvation Army unit as a facility, but it has a long history. And so you're kind of coming in a situation. And I'd say for a period had a kind of, uh, I call it high church army feel. And I mean that that not like a necessarily liturgical sense, but there's this such a rich connection to the history. Um, and I would say there's probably only five or six Salvation Army units out of 1,200 in the United States that have that same kind of rich heritage, which is a can be a blessing and a curse when you're trying to evangelize. Um, so, so what Caleb, what you're going to talk about, oh, I'm curious, is like how you serve young adults. Have this desire for church planning, and you do that in the context of the the bastion of of conservatism, uh, and I mean that in no political way con, um, of the territory. Yeah, well, you know, it, it's something that only the, the Lord could have done, I yeah. think, and and the, the sort of the way that that all unfolded was when I came on board at Temple, um, I very. I was very much upfront about this passion for planting, and we had we talked for a long time about uh, Kendall and I at some point being given the opportunity to plant somewhere. But um, you know, I, the spirit sort of very gently steered us in the direction we, we ended up going in, and um, we were all the better for it. And so, to say to answer your question, uh, basically, um, I implemented um, some things I learned at Asbury uh, through a course that um, Dr. Brian Sims, who is a wonderful friend and mentor of mine, uh, had taught. And it was a year-long course in leadership, but specifically mobilizing laity for mission. And it, it was kind of our internship as part as a MDiv student, you have to do an internship. And so it had that internship component, but there's also a curricular component where we literally experienced what he and um, some of the people that he works with do uh, all the time and have been doing for over a decade, which is going into a church, forming a kind of leadership team, giving them a taste of what discipleship is, providing a theology of discipleship, and moving from there into a vision, casting, uh, mission statement, crafting, values, determining yeah, phase. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of a yeah strategic plan sort of uh, uh, phase, and then from there into actually implementing that once you've evaluated what your church is already doing. And so I took that what I learned in that course, and then just began to apply it to our young adult context. And we had uh, an, a retreat with our young adults, and our first retreat. I really just use it as an opportunity to, to just talk about a Wesleyan vision of sanctification. And uh, that was a wonderful kind of beginning really to our community formation. Um, we've seen our, we've had subsequent retreats and every retreat seems to be, uh, I kind of compare it to like New Year's Day. It's kind of the beginning of each year for Creekside in some way where uh, God starts to do something new through yeah. those retreats every year. So that, that was the first year. And then through that first year with the young adults, we, we just right off right away started some kind of rhythm together, but with the intention of beginning an inductive process of co-creating with our young adults the community we wanted to be and the rhythms we wanted to, to share together. And so our second retreat is really when that process began the next year. And 
I, again, just implemented some of what I learned in that course at Asbury and our young adults really latched on and um, committed themselves to that process over that weekend. And that conversation produced so much fruit uh, and really gave us a sense of um, group identity, of unity, of energy around mission and around discipleship. And that propelled us into subsequent conversations where we continue just to uh, refine and reassess what we all were um, thinking that the Spirit was doing in us as a community. And uh, by the end of that year, we had essentially the scaffolding of a strategic plan that we began to really implement in earnest. And that began having, that, that led to us having a weekly contemporary worship meeting on Sunday mornings before what we call the main service uh, in the chapel. Uh, we ended up at some point moving the time of that into the evening to make it more accessible for certain folks. Um, we also implemented small groups uh, as a part of our community rhythm and a men's small group and a women's small group. We decide to have monthly get together so that you could essentially invite someone who maybe wasn't affiliated at all with the Salvation Army or with church to what would be a, a low pressure kind of um, yeah. event. Um, and we continue to have the annual retreat. And um, in terms of the things that defined us, uh, our, we, we had a vision statement, it's still our vision statement, which was uh, that Creekside is a community woven together, striving to live in love like Jesus. And so in everything we do, that is our, our main purpose, our central aspiration is to be that community. And then in order to uh, make that vision real, to realize that vision, we have a mission, which is um, uh, also a, a big part of what marks our community is, is that mission statement, um, which I'm currently blanking on. It's sort of embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, it's the, um, to accept, befriend, disciple, and serve like Jesus. That's essentially our, our mission okay. statement. There you go. And that reflects the values of uh, friendship, acceptance, discipleship, and service. So that forms, like, yeah, like kind of the skeleton of what is Creekside. And then the rhythm helps us to provide opportunities for realizing the, the vision that we have of being that community. Yeah. This is so interesting. So what's happened? Let me see if I can frame this up and then you just correct me if I've got it wrong. Uh, you're, you're in this context where you're, you're leading young adult ministry in what for the Salvation Army is, a large Salvation Army church. And as you're getting that, you're developing community. You're figuring out like, what does it mean for us to live out the, the mission of the Salvation Army in our community? But yet like, there's something distinct that needs to happen from the larger body. This, and in this case, traditional body. Like, how does that happen? And essentially, to me, it's like I, I, ecclesiologically, I'm not quite sure how to define it. But you would be forming a sub church or your own church is connected to this larger, larger church. But you're doing this in a, in a different place. And let me just like say what I know of it. I don't know very much. You, you're, you have small groups. You have worship. We likely have giving of some kind. Um, and it's the Salvation Army. It's based on the Salvation Army's articles of faith and doctrine. But yet you don't wear, as far as I know, don't wear a uniform. There's aren't some of the traditional markers of the Salvation Army. And I'm not saying it's good or bad. But this, to me, this is incredibly new. And you take a whole group of young adults, not away from another core to start another core, but yet you have mm -hmm. this sub-community happening within the life of the Atlanta Temple Core. I, there's something that I, I've i never heard of that. Like generally when we think about starting a new core, you get some money together to go to a new community where there's a need for social services and you you start another uh, a whole other um, Salvation Army unit of operation. Um, but, but this is clearly uh, a, a community of believers, not a, not a group that's trying to start an entire Salvation Army unit. All right, I said a lot there, but it may, correct me if I've got some of that wrong. No, I, I think you're you're really you're describing it well, and um, we don't see ourselves as a separate church, but just one um, another connection point to Atlanta, the Atlanta Temple Core, one that, as you said, is still very 
grounded in salvationism and our articles of faith and the heritage of the Salvation Army, um, but is still presenting it in perhaps a new way um, and providing new connection points for folks who, for them, they just resonate with a different expression of salvationism at some level. Now, many of us, myself included, still participate in the weekly worship of the Atlanta Temple Corps at, at large, uh, and I'm blessed to do so. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the ways I think about sort of the distinctions in all this is, um, well, first of all, the Temple Corps has what they call a hybrid service. So there are contemporary elements right, of right. meeting as well as traditional. Um, but I think uh, something that I has been a helpful framework for me uh, is this distinction between form and value. And I think in worship, you can have various forms of worship and our forms of worship can have equal worth. They can all be um, worthwhile for a believer to invest energy and, and uh, to participate in. Um, but that doesn't mean that they don't necessarily have different value, uh, that mm -hmm. they don't still uh, have a different kind of formative value than um, other forms do. Um, I should say before I even really dive into that, that, uh, you know, at the very start, worship is about worshiping God, right? Right, I mean, right. Uh, you know, sometimes we can talk about worship in such a way that it's the way we speak is mostly about our re receiving something from worship. Mm -hmm. I think worship is about what we receive, but it's for us primarily about, uh, you know, praising and worshiping God for who he is and what he's done in our lives. And yes, we do receive from him in worship as well. Um, it's it's a thing that reflects the fact that we're in relationship with God and in relationships there's that mutuality yeah um, but that with that as preamble um, when it comes to worship forms you know every worship form uh, is uh, the product of a particular historical context yeah um, a product of uh, per particular um, styles or community. Uh, Community, yeah. and so many factors. You know, when you listen to, uh, for the Salvation Army, brass band music, there's a variety of styles that a brass band, brass band can play. But even so, the instrumentation of it still carries a certain value that's different from the value that, like, a contemporary worship band right, might carry. Right. And uh, it does something different. Like it's like it how, how it different. functions. So like there is, there is yeah. value to it and it's of equal yeah. value what we're saying, but what that does and what it communicates is something distinct. Now you can work really hard to make that brass band. And I'm a brass band guy as are you. I mean, I've, I have published pieces by the Salvation Army. I probably like it too much, but the, yeah. the value that it communicates yeah. is different. Like it, it, like some pe some person could come in like I've had this happen before. Some person came in one time uh, to a Salvation Army meeting where I was playing my horn, and they were really mad at me for the band because we didn't have woodwinds in the band. Like like truly frustrated. Like how dare you not include the yeah. flute? And like yeah. uh, actually, in, in my context, like everywhere I was, I'm like come on in, saxophones, whoever. Like it, it yeah. enhances the 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 texture and timbre of the music. But um, but but. Th that communicate the brass band itself communicates something. Now, also, it can be there are people who are Christians today and Salvationists today because they found a, they played a horn and they came in like, hey, I could play yeah. in that band, and so they came in. Or people who they hung around because they were in the in the Salvation Army because they went to camps in summer and they played and they found something they were interested in. It made them successful in band at school, and it's just a, yeah. so like there's that is a value. The, here's here's the challenge for me is uh, I, and this is something that puts me at odds with many people in the Salvation Army, is that I believe like that part of why the Salvation Army exists is to evangelize, is for people to come to faith. And I think that it happens in the context of Salvation Army churches. That's why I think Salvation Army churches should exist. Like we, we exist as a church. Um, so if that, that that's the case, like how does our, how do our worship services invite new people in? And mm -hmm. I think that the value of that form of the brass band sometimes keeps people from becoming in, becoming involved. For whatever that sound does, whatever it creates, maybe it's an out of tune sound as it could be 
more at the Jackson core where I'm I'm playing, right? It, compared to the <laughs> Atlanta Temple core, which has yeah. you know PhDs in music who are uh, who are pl- playing and, and leading those groups. Yeah. So um, I I think like what it communicates yeah. to the outsider. That's my point. Is like it, yeah. it, it, sometimes it hurts us with the outsider, um, and that's my, that's my concern with it sometimes. Well, and, and you know, I, I don't think you're entirely wrong about that. Um, I w- I am one of those that was deeply formed by the brass band tradition. Someone who, uh, at different points in my life, was a more attached to the Salvation Army because of the opportunity to be in a brass band. Yeah. You know, to this day, there are moments in my spirituality where the thing I need more than anything else is to turn on Resurgum or I'm with you. The I'm with you. or and the way the Lord ministers to me. Uh, at the end of the King of Triumph uh, with Loey comes on clouds ascending, you know, it's like hard for anything else to really compare for me. It's a soul um, language for me. Like it, is. it, 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 oh, it yeah. connects me and, and it's part of my heritage, but I have to yeah. realize that not everybody shares that same, um, yeah. that same thing. Keep going. I'll and let I you, think, I'll let you talk. <laughs> but no, I, I think that, um, recognizing that every form has a different kind of value and has something different to offer should invite us then to participate in various forms of worship, I think. Uh, if, if it has some, if there's something in the form that affects what the, that particular form of discipleship is doing, then it's great then to open yourself up, I think, to various forms of worship uh, and to provide opportunities for various forms of worship. And sometimes that means having a hybrid meeting where you're able to weave together the various styles and you, know, you experience, uh, you know, kind of something upbeat in the brass band where you're singing Storm of the Forts of Darkness or what have you. And then that is a- able to lead into maybe uh, some contemporary worship song that provides more of a reflective kind of atmosphere, what have you. But I also think that hybrid is one way of approaching it. Another way is to have a meeting that is entirely in one style. Maybe that is a traditional meeting. You know, my friends in the Methodist Church will frequently have, um, you know, a, a, there are churches where they have a traditional service in the morning and then a contemporary service later in the morning. And um, that, that's the approach that their church has taken. Uh, and I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't think there's anything wrong with offering more opportunities for worship and right. uh, more opportunities for, ma- for formation that are distinct from one another. Uh, and I mentioned Storm of the Forts of Darkness. This is an example that I like to bring up. And just in that, um, a lot of Salvationists will know that a Storm of the Forts of Darkness is, was written to the tune that was to a tune that was a bar tune that was a tune that was very familiar to people who would have spent ta- a lot of time in bars. It's a good old whiskey, down. drink it down. Drink yeah, exactly. It down. Uh, if you want a detailed history uh-huh. of this, go back to my interview with Dr. Nathan Miller, my brother, and he writes on that piece in his doctoral dissertation. But that's another story. Keep going, keep going. Right, well, but I, I have to imagine then that one of the, the things about that at the time that was genius was you were doing something that other Christians at the time would have been very hesitant to do yeah, 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 yep, yep. sacred language and put it to a, a tune like that. Mm-hmm. And so in that way, it had a kind of transgressive quality, you might say. It felt a little rebellious. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And so it had a, a kind of appeal to the, the just the people that the Salvation Army was wanting to appeal to. And in that way, it had a different kind of formative value. Yes. Uh, so, oh, yeah. So what's the value important. now? Like the value is yeah. not the same thing. Now. I'm, I want to interrupt you. I just right. can't, I can't hold it in, Caleb. No. Like the value now is like we're celebrate when you sing that we're celebrating that we and you and I are part of this we because we're yeah. generations in. Like I, my my family history goes back to those days. Like I had family members who sang that song and it felt like transgressive, as you said, to yeah. them. Okay, but now I'm singing that song in part because of that legacy. Like I'm saying it, we used to do that. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm saying we used to be the ones yeah. who who really took that and did something that was a little risky for the sake of winning people to Jesus. I mean that's what I'm saying. I, yeah, no, I and I, you know, um I, yeah, I love that we're talking about this right now because I I think it's something that is sometimes missed. I mean 
One of my favorite, my other favorite examples of this is the role that the brass band initially had in marching, right? And there's still a core that march today, you know, and it's, but particularly in England, I, I think there are a number of core that still have their band march uh, right. during the course of sun, uh, Sunday. But um, I, that's not something that I, was all that familiar with me, sure. for me growing up. I mean, we, we would participate in marches at, uh, at the course that I was a part of. Um, but very occasionally, and um, I remember being at Congress in uh, 2015 in London, uh, the International Congress, and at the end of that Congress, there's going to be a march to Buckingham Palace. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I remember as a young adult, you know, as a young adult, still a young adult, just barely, <laughs> um, and thinking, you know, I might go to that, I don't know, you know, that I guess that might be cool. Well, I ended up going and getting there toward the tail end of it. Yeah, I was there. Too. And as I, uh, yeah, well, and it, I, as I arrived, you know, all of a sudden I'm starting to realize, okay, this is way better than I imagined it was going to be because you're, you're starting to feel the energy of the crowd and hearing the, the, the noise of what was going on. So I get up to the road and I see the ISB coming down the road and the general leading the march and they're playing one of these great marches, you know, whether it's, um, Cairo Red Shield, or is it Red Cairo? I always get That's it. That's it. You got it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I got it right. Um, or one of those wonderful, just, you know, really in your face kind of marches. Yeah. And I began to cry. I just began to cry because all of a sudden, all these things started to click together for me where I, you know, I'd experienced this in my heritage at some level, but I began to see in that moment that the brass band was designed to be this form of aggressive Christianity, a phrase that's used in our, our yeah, tradition. Yeah. Booth, yep. this, this, yeah, this, I mean, you could imagine the brass band going down these narrow roads and the walls just shaking and things rattling because of the, the intensity of what was happening, the, just the noise of it and hearing the bass trombone come in with you know, these wonderful, deep, loud, you know, belches, you might say, <laughs> just it was, and you know, our, our music forces at the beginning were not all that skilled, nowhere near as skilled as they are today. And what in that moment was conveyed to me was the, the extent to which the brass band is this kind of um, just, yeah, militant, uh, aggressive, bold, uh, strong proclamation of the power of God to save. Yeah. Of the yeah. power of God to come into yeah. any space to disrupt what's happening and to proclaim without fear that Christ is Lord and that nothing's going to change that. And in fact, what's even better is that Christ has come to save you, yeah. even you, despite all that you've done in your life. And we're committed so faithfully to this that we're going to make some noise. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to come in and we're going to storm the forts of dark. You know, so it was like seeing that in that moment, I all of a sudden I just felt formed by it and and my faith deepened by it. Um, and uh, there have been times where I've just been stuck on YouTube for hours on end watching band, Salvation Army bands march around the world in different settings. Um, I, I think it's a, actually a beautiful expression that we've somewhat lost. I, I, like sure. I said, I think some people are still do. Um, so I guess the better question, though, is not necessarily how can we recreate that, although I would love for Salvation Army Bands to start marching more often, um, but more what's our form of that today, that kind of, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, bold, fearless, uh, evangelical yeah. action yeah. to That's go question. behind enemy lines. Yeah. yeah. It's a function. So I, 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 I've used, and maybe to my detriment, form and function or um, mission yeah. and model. And mm -hmm. so you have the mission that's primary and then you have the model that can change. You have the form that is uh, the form functions. So uh, all together, like, is that, is that form functioning? Is it form the, and it, it's easy to pick, in fact, brass bands is an easy, a helpful one to use because it's right. familiar and, in this yeah, context. You can talk about so many other things. Yeah, yeah. Um, it could be on. uniform, yeah. it could be terminology, it could yeah. be structure. Um, I don't think it's theology, though I don't yeah. think it's like our 11 articles of faith. But so you have formed this function. And so that functioned for you and that functioned for many people. 
But the question is like, and this is why I kind of want to push to it, is that like the young adults of your core were similar people to you, like similar uh, backgrounds to you. Was, is that functioning within the context of a local congregation um, bringing people in in the same way like it, it was that beautiful way you described it like the the boldness of the gospel the the big how big god is to be able to bring people in and save people where they are um mm-hmm. uh, like I, 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 there's a way that i could disagree with myself in this but at the same time i'm not sure that it's functioning that way so when you go and you start a, a, a community creekside yeah. that's not the form that you take, it's not functioning, and the value of it is different based upon the people you're trying to reach. Is that right? Yeah, and you know, I, one of the things that I'm kind of even putting together even now is the extent to which, in that example, the this huge loud brass band making some noise through London, that was so well matched for the theology of Booth Two, which was this message of full salvation. Yes. Of, yes. Uh, salvation for anyone. And anyway, so I say that to also say, to answer your question, Creekside, I would say, is continuing to wrestle with this question of what is the form that uh, would function well for the underlying theology that we're trying to communicate and for the mission. Um, And, uh, you know, I, I think we are very much in our infancy still. Um, we have seen folks come into the, the Salvation Army uh, through Creekside or yep. be re-energized about mission um, within the Salvation Army and, and more importantly, uh, re-energized around um, holiness and discipleship yep. and uh, being in relationship and um, with, with Christ. Um, but, uh, you know, we're also in the midst of uh, you can't really even say post-pandemic world, right, uh, right. pandemic world. And um, I, like with a lot of other churches, our best laid plans suddenly didn't work all that well in the face of uh, the pandemic. Right. And now that said, in the midst of this kind of wilderness moment, God has been continually, to re- continually refocusing us on the things that are most important, like um, holiness and intimacy with Jesus and conveying the gospel and being unafraid and having a confident proclamation. Um, and uh, and also focusing us on community and what what is Christian community, formative community? What is the church called to be? I mean, what does it mean to be in the living bride of Christ? Yeah. Um, and so uh, through uh, various conversations last year and through um, just the implementation of some new things, we've continued to discern around that. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for where God is going to lead us in, in this next stage. And so, I want to say, just, I, 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 I'm very excited by this idea of what you've done and not you, like the communities. I know you're kind of the spokesperson for me today. We could have brought on five people who, you know, who could have talked about it because you, you for, this idea was formed in the community, but your educational yeah. experiences put you in a position to help guide this community through that. So I don't mean to minimize uh, the community's role by saying what you've done. So forgive me for saying that. Well, no, yeah, and I'm happy you highlight that too because it allows me to just emphasize what you said that, my feeling and the feeling of our community ultimately has always been that if it's not us co-creating this together, yeah, then it's not going to be what really God wants it to be. That yeah. vision, you know, we can often think of vision as something that only, you know, a positional leader receives and then yes, dictates yes. to those that yeah. are under their leadership. And you know, I think that that, pro- that might have worked for a time, but I think we're in a time, a context where that sort of leadership just doesn't communicate right. as it once did. Right. And sorry, um, important- sorry, those of you who are in those positions. <laughs> and I'm in one of right. those positions here at Wesley Biblical Seminary. So, like, look, but it's not yeah. the same. And I, I just think, culturally speaking, it just it doesn't work as it once did. Um, not that there's not any value to that. Oh, no, yeah. 
times have changed. And, uh, and I do think, though, still that there is um, some theological value to that. You know, yeah, you look absolutely. at the early church and yep. um, there's this principle of Christian conference of coming together yep. to discern what is good for them and for the spirit. Oh, Caleb, and, watch out, my um, man. You're going to get in trouble. You know, <laughs> that's an important aspect. And there are, you know, there are expressions of that in the Salvation Army, that principle of Christian conference. Um, and uh, I don't know that I necessarily want to go down that. Uh -huh, I do. <laughs> so uh, here's, this, <laughs> here's this interesting, like you said, like the, I, I mean, I publicly called for more democratic impulses with this sure. Salvation Army Christian yeah. conferencing. So like that, that is a problem. Like essentially, like we don't exist in a place where we have a polity or a theology of the church that sees the local body as determining its reality. I, 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 yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to be harsh, and I, I recognize I'm trying to be speaking the indicative. This is what is <laughs> right. That this is where we are, and it's not going to work. I don't think it's going to work. Maybe it will. Maybe I'm wrong on that. But here's how that expresses. It. I'm going to be very brash, and I might get in trouble <laughs> for it. But let's say, <laughs> let's say, and hey, look, what are they going to do? Move me? Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm just not co-signing what you're saying. You're not, Go ahead. This is not Caleb Loudon. This is Andy Miller. They're not going to come and say to Creekside, a group yeah. of gener uh, generational salvations who have brought new people into the faith, new people into their community, that are worshiping in a different way. It's connected to this congregation. If the, you, you might disagree with this. They come in, somebody would come in and say, close the doors. It's over. Mm -hmm. You go to Atlanta Temple or not. You're, the truth is they can't do that to you. You're, mm -hmm. you're off the grid in this sense. Like th th now you have a position, you happen to work at territorial headquarters. It's a little different. And some of the other people who are part of your congregation, they have a job that's there, but let's just say that you worked for Motorola and there's a, but you value these same things. Like you found a way, and this is why I think what you're doing, Caleb, and what everybody's doing at Creekside is so valuable is you found a way to express yourself outside the system, but yet do it in a way that's consistent with the history and tradition of the Salvation Army. I don't think anybody would actually do that to you, but no, I don't either. It, yeah. like, so like, it's not really on the table, but it is, but it is in sense, like what you're doing is it subversive to the system. Like, I, it, like rather, and I mean that in a positive way, it's challenging the system to say, we can exist as a congregation outside of the forms that have been established. Now push back, put put me in my place. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, I know I, there are elements of what you say that I am definitely in agreement with. I think just points I would add would be that there is also a lot of value and utility to a model that provides very um, that provides leadership a degree of agility, right, for the mission. Right, and when uh, we're able to move in that way you can see the value of that, you know, things, I just have friends who are in other traditions where, you know, everything's a committee. Yeah. And, I understand. I understand. You know, you, you've heard all that before. Uh, you know, we, we want new drapes for our quarters and it's going to take a committee meeting to decide if we can get new drapes, that whole kind of, yeah, that yeah. Sort of thing. certainly weakness. Um, there too. Yeah, exactly. So every system has its flaws uh, and, or its deficiencies. Um, and, one of the great strengths of ours is the, the agility with which we are able to move uh, when we're able, when we move effectively. Um, uh, and then in terms of uh, just, you know, like you said, no one's probably going to come and shut down what we're doing. And in, in part, because uh, what we're doing are just the fundamentals of our faith. You know, it, it's prayer, it's, uh, devote like it's what the yeah. apostles did. In, okay, in let me ask you this: Who uh, do you, do people in Creekside tithe or fire a cartridge to Creekside, or does it go to Atlanta Temple? No, it goes to Atlanta Temple. It goes okay. to Atlanta Temple. So the Atlanta Temple um, pays for the rent of where wherever you're yeah. functioning. The but tithe you, that Ken and I give goes to Temple, and okay, and, you know, our now we have wonderful new core officers uh, in Major Jose and Candy yeah, Marquez, yeah. and uh, they are able to, you know, they, they provide accountability just as any pastor would in terms of tithes and offering. And, and um, we, re we welcome that accountability. But yeah, we tithe to the body as a whole. Uh, and, um, 
and they are they'll able to see you know which young adults are worshiping in that way um yeah that's interesting so um so you but like do you all have a building do you, do you rent a facility we don't currently have a building we were meeting out of temple uh and then um we began to talk about meeting out of someone's home and in fact over the summer we had a, a worship meeting and a couple meetings out of kennel Eye's apartment uh our little two-bedroom apartment here um which was great um but uh in terms of our meeting together for worship uh, we continued to kind of be in this process of yeah just retooling that a little bit yeah. we've, we've never stopped meeting for small group and we actually are meeting for worship again this coming Sunday, uh, but there has been a whole lot of transition in the last uh, year or so that um, has meant that we've really emphasized our small group ministry above the other things that Creeks right. and I would normally be doing. And part of that transition is again transitioning through this pandemic. Sure, and, sure. You know, struggling with the same questions that um, every pastor or every uh, church community has struggled with. Um, and, uh, and I do want to like underline the fact that that is a genuine struggle. I, just for those listening, yeah. Uh, as your pastor or your leadership body, whatever it might be, is weighing these things, like they're not trying to upset one side of the congregation or the other right. in the process of trying to figure out, you know, what's the best way of keeping everyone safe while also being the church. Um, and, uh, anyway, I just have a lot of empathy for those folks. Absolutely. Right and, and like, I, I have thought about it now that I was in a place where, you know, we, I spent some time this summer visiting, uh, so one of my roles is to be as the Dean or the vice president for academic affairs is to oversee the faculty. And most of the faculty are pastors of churches. So throughout the summer, we visited all their churches, um, before we started to become more active in the local core congregation, the Salvation Army Church in Jackson. So that is a part of like get it, getting an opportunity to visit around um, is a helpful thing for, for me. Now I just lost what I was going to say. I started to get off on. No, you're, you're fine. Um, yeah. I, yeah. Well, I'm sorry to jump off that. I, I, I think that this model is really unique and I'm encouraged by it. Now, uh, here's my question. Do you still attend or did most of the people still attend worship? at the Atlanta Temple Core? So uh, we, I would say mostly yes. Um, we have had folks in the past who would attend prim just Creekside's worship meeting. Yeah. Um, but as we've been uh, less regular in the last uh, few months or so, um, we've you know provided those folks the opportunity or just encouraged them rather to go to the meeting at temple and and i do think part of what god's doing right now in our community is actually um reaffirming our role as very much a part of the atlanta temple core yeah and, and also leading us to um to be in conversation with folks that the other people that are a part of temple and with one another about how we can foster community as a whole community. Um, there's a, a great book by David Kinnaman and the name of the other author escapes right now, but with Barna, uh, the oh, Barna yeah. group. And, Not a fan. Um, yeah, uh, it's uh, the book's called um, Faith for Exiles. And okay. They did all this research over many years about what uh, makes for a resilient Christian who's a young adult. What are the kind of qualities of a young adult who's very resilient and uh, doesn't allow their faith to be swayed by the broader culture. And one of the factors that they identified was inter intergenerational mentorship right, right, and fellowship. Right. Um, and so, you know, as we're a group of young adults, we uh, still recognize the value of intergenerational community and right. uh, want to be committed to that as well. Yeah, I know you're not trying to break off. Like I don't, and I don't. Yeah, yeah. You know, but there's a way that the the values that are needed. The, the forms that are needed to function in a way to be able to attract new people. I think like that's where I keep coming back to is like, yeah. what does it take to make strong congregations? Like for mm -hmm. there to be strong con And if some of the things we're doing get in the way of that, let's, mm -hmm. we might need to think about changing them so that we mm -hmm. can accomplish the mission. So we can accomplish the, 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 so we can function the way that we're intended to function. So like, yeah. Uh, and yeah. it's it's hard it's hard to change that yeah. and it, it okay so let's say you did start to function that way well then do you lose that intergenerational aspect because like you 
so I think some people would be glad just to say, let's just function like we are in the 1970s or 50s or something like, let's just sing Salvation Army songs. Let's just sing songs that we know that are comfortable at like forms the like, and just use our own internal language. But I just don't think that will ever be fulfilling if the purpose is connected to the gospel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, 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 it is a really um, complex question. I think one of the things I think about with that question is, you know, ultimately all we're trying to do is to invite others into relationship with God and to be holy, to be yeah. made holy. I recently heard uh, Billy Aaron in his podcast called the Holy Spirit, the Holy making spirit. I, I mm, think you might have been awesome. quoting someone else too, but I love that phrase, you know, like we are in this work of inviting uh, others into this good news of God's saving work yeah. and salvation, not just from your prior sins and the guilt thereof, but also as you believe, of course, uh, to sanctification and holiness and yeah. uh, the good works that he's laid ahead of us. And so if that is the primary thing, then I think the question ultimately is, what are the forms that point people in that direction? Yes. Yes. And, and in what way do those forms uh, do that? What's the value associated with that form on the, on the path toward um, uh, being made holy and, and more like Christ? And, yes. Um, and so I think there's a conversation to be had between those who, for them, the tradition of the Salvation Army is more resonant. And for those who, for them, the more contemporary style is more resonant. And then I'd also say in terms of the contemporary thing, I feel like we're getting out of uh, one form of contemporary worship in that yeah. things are only, you know, the, this stuff is ultimately not all that perennial, you know, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. moves on. Yep. Yep. And, uh, and so there's even probably a new thing that's happening in right. terms of a worship form and, and something else to be, um, you know, discovered. So yeah, if we can be in conversation together, perhaps even if we're going to do something hybrid, really think about the liturgical elements that weave that all together. And, you know, our worship committee works very hard at this at, um, you know, making sure that in our hybrid meeting, there is this sense of continuity and, yeah. and flow. Yeah. But I think even for creatives in the Salvation Army, there's still many opportunities, though, to kind of craft other forms of worship that provide links to amongst these different things. Um, you know, sometimes we can have a narrow picture of what worship looks like, ultimately, yeah. relative yeah. to the great many expressions across the plan and uh, I had the opportunity to go to Korea as a part of uh, a scholarship or a student seminary and to see um, the largest churches in the world, Guam right. Methodist Church, 90,000 members, and then the beautiful gospel, 1.3 million members or something Amazing. like that. And one of the most beautiful things about Korean Christianity is their extemporaneous prayer together. Right. You know, they lift up their hands and they yell together at the same time, Lord, Lord, Lord. And then they began just to pray all at once. And it sounds like this rushing water, this sort yeah. of torrent moving through the whole sanctuary. And, you know, so that's just an example of a, this kind of creative form that is resonant with that particular culture. And I'm not saying that every core officer is listening, they should put that on the program Sunday. Yeah. Uh, this upcoming Sunday. But at the same time, how can we continue to recast what worship is? searching for the value of a particular form for the sake of holiness. Yeah. Oh, man. That, what a great conclusion. I think I probably need to stop there. <laughs> that is so good. And I know I'm trying to create you, and uh, there's a little bit of me that's trying to live vicariously through Creekside. So <laughs> like, I, I just recognize that here. But I see things that I've, I've dreamt about happening. And as a leader, as, a, as an officer leader, I wasn't able to always make that happen. And I wasn't able to make that happen in the context of a congregation. And I just, I'm thankful that you have been sensitive to the spirit, calling you to be, a, you know, calling you to holiness yourself as a community, but what you're doing. So anyway, I just, I, I applaud you. Yeah, well, thank you. Can I say one last thing? Just yeah. kind of end on a, a kind of optimistic note. Yeah. And I don't think in saying this, I'm being Pollyannish or naive or whatever, but um, I did want to say, you know, I often will hear Christians talking about decline and right. talking about 
the state of the church in the West as a whole. And I, you know, I think there is some value maybe to that discussion. But I was reminded recently, and I think the Spirit spoke to me, that that's ultimately not our position. Like, we are not, the church is actually never in decline, really. Wow. Yeah. You know I mean, the church is victorious. <laughs> Amen. Like, Amen. the gospel is true. The tomb is empty. Jesus is on the throne. And we have the opportunity to offer to folks life yeah. for them to live, to not be stuck in their death and in their sin and in their shame yes. and all the other yes. in, the enemies that everyone faces in life. And so, you know, if we continue to focus on the numerical decline of the church, yeah. we miss the fact that even when the church consisted of just 12 guys yep. in a room, it was never in decline. Amen. It was never about the, it was always about the reality of salvation for the world. And that should be a message that continues to motivate us on uh, and uh, uh, enable us to realize that we are more than conquerors and that nothing can stand against Christ's bride. Amen. Oh, Caleb, what a great conclusion. I, I, I'm afraid to say another word after that. It's, it's <laughs> good. Thanks so well, much for your time. It's great to you. spend some, some time with you and I'll look forward to seeing what comes from Creekside in the future. Thank you so much.